Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. Better late than never, Bruce Pritchard. How are you, Bruce? Well, I'm still waiting on you to smile. I'm smiling. I'm I, it's smiling. finally happening. You know, we, we, this was our Friday show that we said we would tape on Saturday. <laughs> and instead, we're taping it on Sunday. But hey, better late than never. And here we are. Well, well and we're here. We are here. Yes, we are here. You're th- well, you're there and I'm here, but together we are here. We're happy and we know we we'll clap our hands. And we're happy and we know we we'll clap our hands. If you're happy and you know, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. You're very late on that. Hey, we were right on time. I mean, that's pretty good for us not practicing. I uh, see. That's, see how much better impromptu. So oh. we were talking about that before we got on the on the air. Then you then you lectured me and got mad at me when I like have when I don't have notes and I don't have shit. I could just go. Well, here's the good thing. It, 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 we don't ever, you don't ever have notes. I mean, you always do, but you never look at them. So, but I'm you, new. They're right in front of me. Kind of don't, don't, don't tell, uh, don't tell untruths. Okay. The point is I'm totally cool going fast and loose through an episode if you'd like. So let's just, let's just do that for this episode. Let's disregard the notes. Wait a minute. I'm scared. No, no. We're going to talk about cyber Sunday. Oh, <laughs> six. So what do you remember about cyber Sunday? Oh, six. Don't you look at that computer monitor? Well, it was in 2006. You got that. And it was yep. on a Sunday. That's true. We were, we were there so far. So we did a cyber. Yeah. Now that's... this is a variation, if you will, of an event that we had had before, which was called taboo Tuesday. Yeah. And what that was, and, and it was a, um, opportunity for our wonderful fans to be a part of the event and be able to help choose some of the matches, giving them options that they would, uh, they would choose and just have some fun with it because it, it does a lot of things for you. It tells you, you know, what they're, what they're looking for and what they're not looking for. Cause sometimes you can load it up to where you think you're going to get the match that you want to get and they throw you a curveball, and then we're live, pal. God damn. So this is the very, this is the very first installment of cyber Sunday. As you mentioned, it's a variation of the old taboo Tuesday. I like that concept, a Tuesday pay-per-view. I think it was worth a try. It's not on the traditional pay-per-view night, but even now in 2021, it seems like some of those traditions are changing. I think you guys recently announced that uh, there'd be some Saturday shows to look forward to in 2022. They won, but I do want to mention, um, The taboo Tuesday concept is all about, we're going to let the fans be the bookers a little bit, but we are switching from a Tuesday to a Sunday. Did Tuesday really just get chalked up to, Hey, it was a worth a shot, but it was a failed experiment of sorts. I don't know that it was a failed experiment. It's just a lot easier to do it on Sunday. And I think that the viewing habits of people for pay-per-view and special events, it's a lot easier to kind of wind your day down on a Sunday with pay-per-view than get home from school and work and everything else. And then get geared up for a pay-per-view, um, you know, Tuesday in Texas, by God, 
Can't forget that one. That's something you guys tried a few times, but let's catch up where we are here. We covered no mercy last month. It's available in the archives over at something to wrestle.com. And we're coming off of a SmackDown pay-per-view now to a raw pay-per-view. Was it ever real competition between the raw and SmackDown brands in this era? In this era, not, not nearly as much. And I think that when you go way back to the purchasing of WCW, there, there was an, um, there was an air of competition. There was an air of, Hey man, we want to beat you. We want to beat you. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it gets to the point of, well, you need help from one or the other, and we are all a team after all. So it, it wasn't as competitive as it was. I think sometimes amongst the talent it was, but for us, it was, we were all trying to put, we put together the best show that we possibly could. So to launch the promotion for cyber Sunday, we have a three hour raw. That'll uh, never work. That's uh, coming off of no mercy and it's called the season premiere and you combine all the brands of the show. So you got raw SmackDown and ECW, and it also sets up the return of Vince McMahon from the hell in a cell match. And, um, he's going to set up a main event between John Cena, who's the champ on raw big show. Who's the ECW champ and King Booker, who is the SmackDown champ. So we've got a brand extension here. And we're going to have all three champions face off against each other. That's pretty difficult. If you're trying to present that, Hey, all of the brands are on equal footing. Uh, somebody has got to lose here, right? So somebody's going to be the inferior brand. If the champion lost, right? Not necessarily depends on how they lose, who they lose to why they lose. So you lose doesn't make you less than. So there's a big brawl between the three. It leads to matches that were announced for that night. Big show versus Jeff Hardy, King Booker versus Rob Van Dam and undertaker versus John Cena. And on raw, all six announcers are used. So you got the raw announcers, the ECW announcers and the SmackDown announcers. And Meltzer is pretty critical of this. He says, personally, I thought it was a, a, a mess. They used all six announcers and five of the six didn't appear comfortable. JBL who carries SmackDown was a huge negative on this show as he tried to run over everyone. Others who share my opinion of him as an announcer agreed. He was bad on the show. Although one source backstage said Vince is the one to blame because he controls the announcers and was probably getting off on JBL ripping on the other announcers, which to me hurt their credibility. Taz eventually came back on him and it was entertaining, but it also led to a Booker versus Rob Van Dam match being practically ignored while these two tried to one up each other. The worst part is even though Taz did get the better of the first grade level exchange, noting that the announcing job was the only job JBL's wife didn't get him. And that JBL kept calling Taz a midget who wasn't even good enough to wrestle in WWE. Taz says he wasn't allowed to wrestle in WWE because he was short and categorized JBL as a tall, chubby, clumsy wrestler. And JBL's big comeback was saying B13 <laughs> and other references That's to bingo right there. and reference the Taz being an ECW star with the old tired bingo hall knock and claiming to have sold out Madison square garden. The funny part of all of this is Taz in the grand scheme of things was more over in ECW than JBL was in WWE and JBL never sold out Madison square garden. The SmackDown house show where JBL was on top is one of the smallest five crowds in the past 67 years, but for obvious reasons, saying JBL never drew on top can't be said. And Taz can't claim his own ECW level legacy was on the level of JBL holding a WWE version of the world title. JBL took Jerry Lawler, who was actually by far the biggest draw of the three color commentators out of his game. He made fun of Joey Styles' voice and Jim Ross's face. And Ross basically ignored it and tried to call the match. JBL's announcing is controversial and that I like zero or I like it on SmackDown, but more than half of the wrestlers that I hear from are very negative feeling. He goes into business for himself to the detriment of the storylines and characters and matches. Even Taz acknowledged the biggest criticism when he told JBL to get the talent over instead of trying to get himself over to which JBL responded in character that 
an announcing God gets himself over it naturally. So a lot to unpack here. The gist is JBL is uh, stirring it up on the mic. And I've always been under the impression that he was really Vince's mouthpiece that if Vince had a thought, if Vince had a feeling, if Vince had an opinion, he would pipe it into JBL's headset and JBL would espouse it. How much of this really is JBL and how much of this is Vince having fun? I'd say it's probably 70, 30 JBL. And because look, that's John's job is to be a controversial mouthpiece on the, at the desk. I mean, that that's what he did. He was controversial. He was meant to stir shit up. So that was his job. That was his character. And that's what he did. What'd you think of this, uh, infighting and, and, and six uh, announcers on sucks. the show? Look, man, realistically, a two man booth is, is the best, uh, pretty much in anything from, you know, football, wrestling, baseball. I, it, it's hard to distinguish. You get, you get beyond two guys that have any kind of chemistry at all. Um, you get used to it. You get comfortable with it, and they can tell you stories without stepping on each other. You add a third man into the booth, much less, oh, God. I mean, a three-man booth is difficult, and I don't think the greatest thing in the world. But uh, you know, any more than that, it just waters everything down and makes it difficult for anybody to get a word ed- edgewise. Could you uh, imagine having six of us no. on right now trying to do a show? No. It'd be horrible. Let's mention that Umaga is going to defeat Kane in a loser leaves raw match after, uh, Armando interferes. Why the move of Kane? Armando off- Alejandro Estrada. He did it much better than that. He did it great. Do you remember why you're moving Kane here off of raw? I, I really don't. I just think that more than anything was to kind of freshen things up and move, move a few of the chess pieces. The observer would write Sean Michaels and triple H beat Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch in a street fight in five minutes and 50 seconds. They did a promo before the match showing the South Carolina Gamecocks mascot saying that Vince would like him because he's a big cock. Triple H was doing a bunch of cock jokes and nobody in the crowd was laughing. Apparently the show was scripted for the Gamecocks. That's because they like their cock in South Kakalaki. Apparently the skit was uh, scripted for the Gamecocks mascot to appear, but whatever the skit was, there was a standards and practice issue and it was nixed. So triple H in his promo acted like the mascot had agreed to do something and backed out noting that somebody told the mascot, it wouldn't be good for his image. It came off like the usual WWE lack of self-awareness of how the real world sees the company and being mad when people won't play ball with them over it. What do you make of that write-up? Do you remember this situation with the Gamecocks? No, but a lot of times that, that, that happens where you get there. God, we had a many situations with, and you know what the funny thing is, is it's always guys wear a costume and a mask that you never see their face or anything else about them. Um, that don't want their gimmick, um, messed with, and they're, they're very protective of it. And like, if you were to go to a baseball game or one of their games and them wanting to do a bunch of crazy stuff with you, they would do the same thing. We would do the same thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, maybe not. Um, and they would be just as upset because they, they have no problem asking other people to do silly stuff. But when they're asked to do silly stuff, sometimes they get cold feet and it's, uh, some people get it. Some people don't. So fabulous Moolah and May Young are introduced to the crowd because of course they're in South Carolina and Dave would write Moolah and May Young were actually booked for a larger role. They were contacted this past week, but both women who were 83 had recently fallen. Moolah was supposed to wrestle on the show. I'm not clear of the specifics, but it sounded like she was going to wrestle Molina in a women's tournament. The scripted idea was for Moolah to wrestle, have a woman interfere and for May to give that woman a Bronco buster. It makes sense that Tori Wilson got that spot and that crystal was saved from a Bronco buster, believe it or not. But obviously the match would have to be very short, but Mula still has that old school mentality where she wouldn't be happy losing a short TV match. Moo had fallen. May had fallen on her hip in the bathroom. When she went to weigh herself, her hip wasn't broken, but it is very sore. She was using a walker backstage and even in front of people, and she is not permanently disabled. And she is expected to be able to get rid of the walker soon. 
Moolah fell two weeks ago when she was in New Jersey and an autograph signing. She was hurt, but also did not break her hip. Buddy, the idea that we're having conversations about these ladies wrestling at 83 and breaking hips, that tells you who they were in the biz, does it not? And, you know, the hardest part is telling them no. Yeah. Because they, they were, you know, looking at it as like, hey, honey, I can do it. I've been hurt my whole life. I can do it. It's nothing but a thing. And, you know, different time, different place. Uh, they were players, man. Both Mula and May. God, they wanted to do anything and everything. And they didn't, they didn't want to be, they, they looked at it as, well, you're protecting me because I'm a woman. Or you're protecting me because I'm old. Well, I'm an old woman and I'm going to do it. <laughs> And prove to you that I'm tougher than your young men. Um, that was that was Mula and May's mentality that they didn't want to be protected. They wanted to go, and trust me, they would hit you just as hard. Um, they didn't pull anything. They were absolutely, uh, I thought, two wonderful, wonderful people. So kind of right there up, right there up on my thing, giving me a kiss. Well, there you go. Yeah. So there's this odd promo that we have to talk about. Mitch of the spirit squad admitted that he sucked, but that he had four friends who would help him defeat Ric Flair and Flair comes out to a big pop. And then Roddy Piper comes out to a big pop and then IRS and Ted DiBiase follow to a smaller pop. And then Arn Anderson appears and gets a huge pop and Flair beats Mitch in a minute while the veterans chase the spirit squad to the back. It's odd to portray yourself as saying you suck, but the pops, these guys got, man, these wrestling fans in the crowd, they love their nostalgia. Did they not? Sure. They do. I think that, uh, in the right increments, nostalgia is good. Uh, Cena and taker are going to be in a no contest as the champions brawl to end the show. Um, why do you think we never saw a full length, real deal Cena under undertaker WrestleMania match? Excuse me. How much have you had to drink today? I've had about 18 waters. You're my fifth podcast today. You're not drinking soda anymore. Are you? Nope. I'm off the soda, baby. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have one a week. It's like uh it's like a treat, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just chugging those big old liters of water. I, I even got a uh, Dave Silva on it. Dave's a water chugger now. Yeah, I'm I'm getting there too, but see, I drink the little ones. Yeah, I see. So I that. have like one or two of these a day, and I save it for when I'm on air, so I, so I can relax a little bit, you know, just kind of pop one and, and and relax a little bit. But as far as your question is, Undertaker and Cena at WrestleMania, I don't know that timing never really matched up. Taker and Cena, you know, when Cena was a heel working with Taker, I think that Taker gave Cena some of his best matches, and vice versa. And Taker elevated Cena to a main event level during their issues. And I just don't think it ever matched up WrestleMania time. Oh, we glossed over this rated RKO is formed on the cutting edge. And it's amazing to see 15 years later, we've still got this rivalry between edge and Orton. I mean, it's continued all this time. I also want to mention raw goes up against the uh, NFL and the UFC on spike. And the rating comes in as a disappointment. So that's the reason we're pulling out all the big guns here. Um, you go from a 3.8, which has 5.03 million viewers. And, uh, it's only up 0.2 from the week before. So we're pulling out all the stops, but still when people are saying, oh, it's, it's a disappointment. It's over 5 million folks, Bruce. That's a hell of a crowd. Yeah. And I don't view it as a disappointment. I don't know who viewed it as a disappointment, but I don't think we did. So, um, in the observer, it's noticed that, uh, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin was hired to be the wrestling guy on creative for raw. Since Michael Hayes was moved to the SmackDown head writer spot. He lasted a whole five days and it's written in the observer that Hayes got heat over getting someone like Garvin in the spot to be his drinking buddy in a high paying spot. Instead of someone who's actually following the business. And knew what they were getting into. Now that's what Meltzer wrote. What did you think of Jimmy Garvin in this spot? Well, I love Jimmy Garvin personally. I don't think that creatives for everybody. And it certainly wasn't for Jimmy Garvin. 
I don't know that uh, Jimmy Jimmy wasn't uh, into the product at the time. Man, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy has been very blessed to live his own life, you know, away from the business. Jimmy's a commercial pilot. You know, he can fly and do whatever he wants to do. He's uh, a happy he's got a happy relationship, pretty pretty easygoing guy, and I don't think that Jimmy was ready for the kind of high intensity creative sessions that that we did. You know, I think he thought, "Okay, man, I'll come in and try it." I think Michael may have wanted it to be successful even more so than Jimmy. I think Jimmy was looking at it like, oh, yeah, hey man, I'll try it. Uh, I've got some ideas about the business. Let's see if they work. But I think that by that point, the business as it was in 2006 had kind of passed Jimmy by. Didn't really know the characters and certainly had never been in a creative team like that. And I uh, just don't think that, I don't think Jimmy wanted to do it. No, I get that. I mean, listen, not everybody, you know, wants to go to some civilian life to this crazy life. I mean, it's a little bit like drinking water out of a fire hose, right? Uh, yeah. And I think for Jimmy at that point in his life, I think even more so. And I don't know that Jimmy was like, Hey man, I really want to get involved. I really want to do this. I want to do that. I think it was more Michael like, God damn boy, you got some great stories, great ideas. Why don't you come on in and help us? Do, do, do. And Jimmy's like, okay, hey, shit, yeah, I'll try it. Because you don't know till you're there. And people think that, oh, man, this is easy. You just sit around and uh, bullshit all day and come with ideas and how easy this is and don't understand the incredible hours that go into the prep to then go into the pitch to then go into the post pitch and try to put a show together and then put that show together and then make it all work. Um, so yeah, I just don't think it was Jimmy's bag and Jimmy recognized that pretty quick. So on SmackDown, we see Chris Benoit defeat Mr. Kennedy when he's distracted by the undertaker to win the U S title. And the storyline here is that Kennedy wants to go to road to escape to raw to escape the undertaker. What did, uh, what taker think of working with Kennedy? I think that at this time, I think everybody enjoyed working with Ken, you know, Ken was a hell of a, a hell of a talent. Hell of a worker, hell of a talker, very good in the ring. I've said it before. I think that, you know, Ken, in some ways, just was either allergic to success and, and just had that mental block that when he would reach a certain level to to go beyond and be the megastar that I truly think he could have been. So Batista's going to win a number one contenders match over Bobby Lashley and fit Finley to become the bookers number one contender for that world title. Um, so we're going back to Bush, Booker T and Batista and you said yourself at SummerSlam, it just didn't work. Is this more of you guys just sort of being out of options with the roster on that side? Do you think? God damn it, Conrad, he won the match. So, I mean, he, he won the. Number one contendership, so you owe it to <laughs> you him. can't yeah. go back on that. Exactly. No, I get that. I, okay. Shit. It's like the guy that's the, the fucking got eliminated in the in the in the rumble or in a battle royal and says, "Well, he eliminated me. Well, why'd you let him?" Okay. Sorry. That's funny. So the Marine debuts in theaters, and it's number six in the rankings. It's got a gross of seven point one million, which beats See No Evil. This has to be considered a, uh, a success for the WWE office, right? You're welcome. I did the, uh, what the hell do they call it? The premiere? Yeah. Okay. So I did the movie premiere at uh, Camp Pendleton and it was, I, you know, I thought, first of all, see no evil was okay. I thought that John did an excellent job in, uh, the Marine. I thought the condemned of the movies that we did is probably at least to my liking, the best movie we did. It didn't have a lot of success because of the R rating. I think that it would have been a little more successful if it wasn't as violent and uh, things of that nature. That was my favorite, but here I thought John did a hell of a job. And, and it was also one of the things that John in and around everybody along the way, was just perfect. I mean, it was, if you were ever going to have a leading man and a, and a big movie star and the star of the movie, 
and trust me, I've been around those guys and in, in that situation, the, the big stars that act like big stars. John was the one there that was pulling everything together and pulling everyone together, including the, the Hollywood people. And I got called into this deal um, roughly three days before the premiere. I'll never forget the call. Vince calls me. I was at home in Texas. He says, hey, we're doing this premiere for the, the Marine, whatever, after, uh, after Raw, but everybody has to be on planes and blah, 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 blah. He goes, I don't have any confidence in anybody running this premiere. I need an asshole. I need you to pick this up and do it. And I could tell I was on speakerphone. I, I love that. Anytime somebody says, I need an asshole. You're like, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. Yeah. And, um, so he had the entire, like people that had been working on this for like six weeks, eight weeks or whatever it is all in the room. And he calls me in the middle of their meeting to tell me I have no confidence in any of this. I need an asshole and congratulations, pal. You're my asshole. I said, well, yes, sir. I, I, I do asshole well. And, uh, I kind of took it over from there. And when I met with everybody the morning of for a, a 6 a.m. production meeting that day to go over the entire day's events. And there were there were like uh, different pockets that all thought they were in charge of this thing. Like the guy doing the TV special, he thought he was in charge. The, the people that were doing the press junket thought that they were in charge. The people that were in charge of the movie thought they were in charge. And I walked into the, I walked in the room and I said, good morning, everyone. I'm the asshole. So let's go over the schedule right now. And the one guy starts talking. I said, no, we're not going to go over your schedule. We're going to go over my schedule. We came up with it last night and here's how we're going to do this. And this is going to run exactly on time. If people aren't ready, then we move on and we do it without them. We're not going to do this. We're not going to take time setting up lights. We're not going to take time doing all this shit, have everything ready to go. We're walking everybody through this and this is going to go on military time. And that's it. The movie will start at exactly 5 58 PM tonight. We will have all of our stuff done afterwards. And immediately I forget what time the movie was over, but it was like, um, seven by seven 15 everybody was to be out of the theater and all talent in limos heading to the uh, airport to catch their flights that night. And then Cena and I would stay and do everything else with, with everybody else. And the, 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 his, his co lead, she was a nice lady. Um, but it was, it was that, and it was run like a military deal because we were on camp Pendleton and I had all these, Sergeant majors, major sergeants and lieutenants and the camp, the head of the, the whole base came in at the end. And, you know, it was just insanity. But 715, everybody was in limos on their way to the uh, airport and they all made their flights. So it worked out. And it was the only time in my life. Now, I had blacked out before. I've drank so much that I blacked out. We were celebrating, and of course, we, we get back to the bar at the, uh, the Marriott in San Diego on the water, and Cena kept the bar open for us, and so we're celebrating. We're having a good time, and they're doing shots, and you know me. I don't do shots. No. Don't do shots, and John's like, Bruce, you know, it's my, it's my first movie. I mean, could be my last movie. Uh, you know, do a shot with me. And so I did the Ric Flair and I tossed the shot. Wow. And he caught me. Oh no. And he's like, you know, I've never been so insulted and blah, blah, blah. And it was a dirty Sanchez, which is tequila and some other crap, but just tequila does not sit well with me. It really, there's something about it, man, that, that can make you get super, just quasi metaphysically crazy drunk. And I did it with him. And then I, he sat, we sat together and we did every shot, making sure the other one was drinking everything that they had in it. Long and short of it is I woke up <laughs> in my bed, tucked in 
Now, when I say tucked in, I was put in my bed in my suit, shoes still on, tie still on, in my suit, and the the covers tucked in to the bed. So that when I started come to and started to get up, it's like everything's like I'm kind of like tied down. Not tied down, but I'm I'm tucked into the bed and the sheets and shit. So Cena apparently had gotten me back to the room, put me in bed, tucked me in, took my briefcase, put what he thought was my phone on my briefcase, and I guess went and tucked everybody else in they needed to tuck in. And when I woke up, it was 3.45 in the afternoon. Oh, my gosh. The next day. It is the one and only time that I had ever missed a flight, especially going home, like by waking up late or doing something stupid like that. So my entire career, I had never missed a flight. And that was the one and only time that I actually missed the flight for not being able to, to get to the flight. And I know that I had uh, wake-up calls and alarms and all that shit set. So you were like in a hotel way past checkout. Oh, yeah. Like your key didn't work. They just hadn't gotten to cleaning your room yet. Yeah. By four hours and 45 minutes. So that's a bad day. That was That was a bad day. But then when I get to my phone, it's not my phone. It was someone else's phone. Oh, that's even worse. Which meant someone had my phone. With all kinds of... uh... So I start calling my phone on their phone. And I'm like, hey. And it was Sue Aitchison. Sue Aitchison had it. And I was like, hey, thank you. And she goes, I think you have my phone. I said, all right. Well, anybody calls me, have a call, you know, vice versa. And I'll get your phone back. So wait a minute. Just so I'm clear. Sue was down there going shot for shot with y'all too? I don't know if she's going shot for shot, but I'm, I'm sure she was hanging there for a while. And, uh, but somehow our phones got mixed up. I was going to say if she could hang and you couldn't, that's the story and a half right there. Oh, well, as Susie could probably out drink me. Yeah. And he, I've seen you put in some work before. So that's, well, some. I ain't scared. So the next week on raw from LA rated RKO comes out and one of the classic comedy sketches and really a staple of WWE programming dressing as your enemies and mimic them, mimicking them. Easy for me to say edge is triple H Orton is HBK. And it's interesting to look back at this 15 years later. Uh, what do you remember about this little vignette? You know, again, it was fun. And I think that when you look at the talent involved in it was all able to take a lot of that material and make as much humor as you possibly could out of it. And, uh, both everybody liked making de- digs from, you know, the comment about, uh, edges segment is raw sex, live sex segment, highest rated, but, uh, edge couldn't rise to the occasion, you know, get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little childish humor. I think sometimes. Triple H said Randy Orton was an icon because Orton is, uh, the number one, most downloaded WWE superstar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's just a lot of it. You know, you look back, doesn't play well today, but it was, like I said, very childish. Uh, this is right up Vince's alley though. Is it not? He loves that, you know, hearkening back to the, the school, the, the grade school stuff. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I, more than anything, just kind of simple, you know, uh, simple humor, uh, that without being over the top. But I think again, when you look at it, then that's kind of what people did then. And, and you look at it through today's glasses. Doesn't, doesn't read well. Doesn't, doesn't play well. No, wish we had this one back, uh, crime time debuts and they become a, uh, a staple here for a little bit. They pick up a win in their debut match over the spirit squad. Uh, was this the realization that it was time to put the spirit squad to bed and, and, and try to get over a new act. Do you think at this point, the spirit squad was starting to maybe run its course? I think the spirit squad had run their course. Uh, 
half of them were into it. Half of them weren't. Well, that, so never, that never works. It never, it, it's not going to work unless they're hundred percent into it. I think that, uh, once everybody got in their ear that, oh, this gimmick will never work. This is a silly gimmick. Um, silly gimmicks have succeeded and done incredible business. So Kevin Federline debuts as an A-list celebrity friend of Johnny Nitro and Molina. Uh, we've touched on that whole story before Vince comes out and announces that the fans will be the ones choosing the championship as far as which one will be on the line between big show King Booker and John Cena. Cena invites Federline and asks him, uh, what title should be on the line and Federline answers Cena's WWE championship. And then of course he gets hit with the FU. So nice little celebrity moment, especially when you've got John Cena trying to make waves outside of the WWE, uh, be a big movie star. If you get an opportunity to have some interaction with a, a celebrity here, uh, 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 you, you jump at that, right? Well, sure. And I think there were some people that were thinking, well, fuck, we get Kevin Federline, Brittany's going to come and do something on the show. Take a ride. Is that, re- is that really what, what he was thinking? That is really what I think Michael was thinking during the time. And I think there were a lot of us that were hoping that. Sure. That, you know, Brittany may come take a trip with him and maybe appear on the show and do a little something with us. They were both hot at the time. Kevin was putting his album out at the time and was extremely controversial. But behind the scenes, as I've said before, one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet didn't say no to anything, was extremely respectful and, um, somewhat intimidated by the whole, the whole thing. So it was, it was, he was great to work with. He really was. Uh, so speaking of celebrity involvement, now we have this, uh, pretty infamous segment with Umaga and, uh, Chris Pontius and Steve-O from Jackass. Oh, Steve-O gets, uh, knocked out by Umaga, but he's concussed. So he doesn't know how to stay down. And Umaga, as a result of that, just beats the shit out of him. Uh, what do you remember about this happening? What's going on backstage? Did Umaga have any heat? I mean, he's trying to protect the business or what have you, I'm sure. Talk me through this. Well, no, I mean, both the whole Jackass crew, those guys were awesome to work with as well. Um, but they're, they're crazy, man. They're, they're a little out there with their shit. They, they believe in their own shit. They do their own stuff. You know, Steve-O boxed Butterbean and got the crap knocked out of him in a Japanese department store. Uh, their whole tale is about being controversial and, and doing different things. And Steve-O was one of those guys, no, man, do do what you do. Do what you do. I want to, you know, I want to feel it. I want to do it. And I don't know if Umaga took it as, okay, he wants me to beat the shit out of him. Um but yeah, he got his bell rung a little bit. Wasn't the first time he got his bell rung when you go back and look at all the crazy shit they've done. Pontius was um, hilarious. And we we tell the story about <laughs> Vince didn't realize that Pontius's gimmick was running around in a G-string. And was a little bit like, what the hell's he wearing? Got, what, got, got, what the hell? Um, so that was kind of funny. But it wasn't funny for those who were directly involved in the production of that because, yeah, it, it kind of looked like he was a little naked out there. That's good practically stuff. was, but he was, I mean, he was game, man. He was funny as shit. They both were, they were, they were awesome. So let's, um, let's talk about the, the fallout from it. You know, this, this beating that happens gets a bunch of attention mainstream wise. I think the guys have both come out and told the story that, you know, they didn't really know what they were doing. Did Amaga do the right thing by making sure they sort of stuck with the script, whether they wanted to or not, or were able to uh, or not? Umaga did a great job of, of protecting his character and, and doing what he would have done in that situation. And the jackass guys understood it. You know, they were like, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. We do what we do and you do what you do. Let's talk about uh, SmackDown. Let's tape directly after this show. David Taylor is going to debut as William Regal's tag team partner. Who recommended Taylor to come in, and why at this point in his career? Dave, I uh, believe, was recommended by Regal, but Dave was one of those guys that was a stalwart that he had come over from England or, and just one of those 
guys that you could count on every time to go out and have one of those great stiff snug matches shit double tough guy super nice guy and and looking at maybe doing something with him and regal wanted to bring him in as a partner and thought we'd try it out uh, chavo beats ray in an i quit loser leaves town match after the numerous chair shots to his knee uh, this is for ray to take some time off for that major knee surgery and it's a pretty heavy angle that an over baby face like Ray is the one who quits here. Um, interesting way to write him off TV. What do you remember of this Chavo Ray beatdown? Well, it's different. I mean, it was a different thing. You would think that I think that those who think they're smart to the business and know how to write things and do all of that would go the obvious route of you, you do this and the heel leaves. And this was the exact opposite and a different way to tell the story. And you, you'll want people to do everything they can on the backside to bring Ray back with that. Coming out of the show, it's reported that, um, Johnny Ace and Vince McMahon bet, met with Bob Sapp in Los Angeles, uh, for the por- portions of our audience who may not be familiar, who is Bob Sapp? What was this meeting about? What do you remember about this? Bob Sapp came in, took rock's job, right? And, uh, Miami? No, you're thinking of um, Warren Sapp. I'm thinking this of is, Warren Sapp. This is Bob Sapp, the Bob, monster. The Bob, who did Bob J- play with? Uh, the Raiders? Well, Bob Sapp was a legend in Japan at this point, doing MMA and was a huge star over there. But before that, he was a football player. Yes, he played football. Yes. Okay, and he, he was a big football player and a big stud. Uh, we actually had brought Bob in when he was looking to do MMA or wrestling and talked to him, got him in the ring and worked with him a little bit. And and Bob was at that point in his career looking for the big money and the killing. So he wanted to do the MMA and the Japanese promotions were really high on Bob, big monster athletic son of a bitch. And Bob had gone over and made his name in Japan and doing these shoot fight things and done some MMA stuff and some pro wrestling Japan, you know, the quasi shoot stuff in Japan. And Bob was looking to see what else would out was out there for him. And why do you think we didn't ever see that happen? I mean, Bob Sapp at one time was one of the biggest stars in Japan. I mean, he, he was like a, I mean, a pop icon, if you will, of the era over there. I mean, he did tons of endorsements and all kinds of stuff, uh, but chat me up. Why do you, why do you think it never really happened where he had a big run in the WWF? I think because in Japan, I think he was looking at it. It was more money for less work. Yeah. Well, all good things come to an end. Uh, it's reported in the observer that the people at Ford field in the prep for WrestleMania were being told the only guaranteed match at that point was big show versus Hulk Hogan. Was that ever on the books or was this just fan fiction? I think that would be complete fiction. It came from the observer. No, no, it would be fiction. Okay. He said it was reported in the observer. WWE files litigation to break the contract between WWE and THQ slash Jack specific deals. Uh, what do you remember about this? And, and why was the company trying to have a hard break and just move on? I think that they reached a point of kind of just you sometimes reach a point with a company that you've done all you can do. And a lot of times just a new paint of coat is what you need with a different, different distributor, different presentation. And that's all it was. So now we have raw from Chicago. This is going to be the 700 raw mind you. And this features the Kevin Federline story continuing when Federline introduces King Booker and Booker puts over Federline CD. And of course that brings John Cena out. And he says that King Booker has officially lost his status as a black man for saying that Federline CD was a treasure, which leads to Ron Simmons coming out and saying, damn, for the first time on TV. So the idea of the whole Ron Simmons, damn is all over a Kevin Federline issue. It's John Cena and Booker T. And of course we know damn is still over like we're over now. What do you remember about this? Uh, you know, I mean, this was just, again, it was better lines involvement, getting to the whole match with Cena 
and continuing to get as much exposure as you can. It's just hilarious. Let's uh, let's take a listen to it here. Hey, Ron, Ron Simmons, former APA Ron Simmons. What's Ron Simmons doing here, King? Got me. Damn. <laughs> How about that? One, uh, just come out, get a little pop, leave everybody waiting, say one word, walk off. That's a good payday if you can get it. Damn. This is uh, from the observer. James pinned Molina in three minutes and 47 seconds with a DDT match was good by WWE women's match standards. These two have a past of disliking each other from OVW and James was clearly rubbing it into Molina that she got to go over. You remember these two folks not getting along, Mickey James and Molina? They had some heat, brother. I really don't know if they did or not. They're both professional and did what they were asked to do. What about Eugene? He beats up Jim Duggan here backstage. That's a real thing. Eugene beating up Jim Duggan, just throwing it out there. What do you remember of that? Well, Duggan shouldn't have fucked with him. Eugene. Mm. Kenny from the spirit squad comes out for his match with Ric Flair and Flair brings out Sergeant Slaughter, Roddy Piper and the American dream, Dusty Rhodes to come out and be in Flair's corner. Uh, how does it, all this come to be for these three to be in Chicago? And, and what was it like bringing Roddy back into the mix? <laughs> Always interesting bringing Roddy back into the mix and things. Cause you never know which Roddy you were going to get. And, um, I, again, I, I clearly adored Roddy Piper and it was nice to have, again, as we talked about nostalgia, to have all these guys in the ring at the same time. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, this, of course, leads to the Spirit Squad against Ric Flair and one of those three to be his tag team partner at Cyber Sunday. Kenny, believe it or not, actually gets the pin on Flair on Raw. And our old buddy EB is outside the ring for the main event between Triple H and Randy Orton. And he ends up helping Orton beat Triple H. This is right around the same time that controversy creates cash is due to come out. I assume that's why you're bringing Eric back around just to help promote the book. It was, it was a, a book that was published by WWE and it was, it's an excellent book and a great read. I highly recommend it. Anybody, uh, with great insight into the business and bringing Eric back, getting him on television was definitely going to help sell books and get Eric some exposure. It's reported in the observer that Tully Blanchard is hired as a producer. And just a week later, it's written that JBL cut a promo on him backstage due to some past issues with him. Tully doesn't work out either. So we tried Ronnie Garvin. Now we're trying Tully Blanchard. What do you remember about his heat with JBL? We tried Jimmy Garvin, not Ronnie Garvin. Sorry. That's okay. Um, you know, Tully came in. I, I don't think, um, they, he definitely had words with JBL backstage or JBL had words with him, you know, there, there comes a time where Tully wasn't the, the easiest guy to get along with in the dressing room ever that I knew. Um, the, the best conversations. And I think I got along pretty well with Tully. Um, didn't dislike Tully by any stretch of the imagination, but Tully could be difficult. And Dully could, Tully could come off as a pompous ass at times and treat younger guys pretty harshly when he was the booker and just different things throughout his career. And, you know, coming into a different environment where Tully wasn't the, the boss's son uh, definitely puts him behind the eight ball, so to speak. And I think that he had had a run in with Bradshaw at some point in his career and in an attempt to clear the air, I don't think that, uh, you know, people react to shit differently. Uh, I'm shit. I, I don't, I don't, I can't hold grudges anymore about shit like that in the past. It's, it's people grow up and they, they're different. Um, seeing Tully in a convention, you know, a few years ago was the first time I'd seen Tully in years. Tully was a different person. Yeah. So 
you know, it's uh, people grow up, people change. I, I do believe that. So here's another interesting note, uh, considering the uh, timing of things. Alpha Jr. signs a developmental deal, and uh, Meltzer says, We're told his promos are his weakness, and he was taught to do them like the old Wild Samoan style in the 80s, and that just won't fly today. His cousin Joe, who's playing at Georgia Tech, is the younger brother of Rosie, and he's also under consideration after he graduates. Joe has said publicly he's not really interested in wrestling, but he has talked about doing the NFL for a few years and getting into wrestling when his career is over. Joe is said to have an awesome look with long hair and crazy tattoos, and he's already a great talker. And of course, we know that Joe we're talking about is not Samoa Joe. Nope, it's Roman Reigns. But let's instead focus on Afa Jr. What do you remember about what would become Manu? Well, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a choice. It was, uh, Alpha Jr. was looking to come in. And I think also at the same time, uh, <coughs> pardon me, Sika's son, Joe, I think it was either a, it may have been his high school or his college, like a trading card. Yep that was sent to us is, is his picture and all this shit. And of course, Jr. being a, a big football fan was definitely interested, but I remember looking at all that shit and saying, wait a minute, why aren't we going after this guy <laughs> here? You know, look at this guy. He's a matinee idol. Um, and it was man, the, 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 the seeds were planted or way early on, uh, for Joe and just kind of felt it was his legacy to come up here and, and do it off a of junior. That was, Hey, he's a big guy and let's see what we got. You know, we had Umaga and maybe he could be an, an, an addition there. So I don't know that off a of junior had the charisma of Umaga or, or obviously, Roman reigns or, or some of the others. Some, some had it, some didn't. Let's talk about Monty Brown. He's on his way in at this time after leaving TNA. Did you know of Monty ahead of time? Uh, did you think he would fit in in WWE? What do you remember of Monty's TNA stuff and how ready you were for him to come over with you guys? Man, I, I was a big fan of Monty when I saw him in TNA. I loved the pounce. And I thought that Monty was one of those guys who was not that big of a, a, a tall wise but was able to utilize his size, much like Rey Mysterio, into a very believable match. He was he was believable. And Monty was was the real deal. You felt it. There was just some authenticity about Monty that made you believe everything he said and everything he did. RVD and Big Show uh, are on the ECW show, and they have a ladder match that Rob wins to earn a title shot, but I don't think he ever wound up getting it. Uh, he got it. Uh, it was in uh, Nuevo Laredo. Uh, remember that Wednesday after the, it came after the Tuesday before that Thursday. Yep. Yep. So what do you remember about big show in this match? I only bring it up because we had a few people, uh, make mention of the fact that it seems like show was a step slower here. Is he just beat up at this point? I think big show was beat up, but also I think big shows not, uh, really keen on heights. Isn't that funny? That's hilarious, actually. The big bastard's, you know, eight feet taller than everybody else in the world, and he's afraid of heights. Uh, I, and I'm not throwing stones. I'm terrified of heights. So I can't, whenever anybody says, yeah, man, I don't know about that ladder. I don't know about being up that high. I'm like, I get it. I get it. So, on SmackDown, we see David Taylor and William Regal take on Bobby Lashley and Tatanka. Uh, I bring up this match for two reasons. First, Taylor tears his meniscus in it. And then after Regal beats Tatanka, Tatanka turns heel on Lashley. This is a mess. Uh, why was Tatanka worth the investment at this point? Do you think? I don't, I, I don't think he was. I just, I think that it was looking, looking back at Chris of, of, Yesteryear when Chris had come in young and hungry and tearing things up. And I just don't know that there was the fire in the step of Tatanka that was when he first came in. 
I just, I do, I just think it was a misstep. I don't think that the timing was right. Um, is there worry about signing someone of Taylor's age, given the injury risk? I mean, he's not here very long before he's hurt. Yeah. And, and again, you, you give people to try and sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't, it's not anything of, of looking at it and going, Oh, well he had a stellar career and to my knowledge was pretty much injury free. Most of his career. Shit happens. So Chris uh, Benoit cuts a promo looking for votes as he's up against Sandman and Kane to face Umaga at Cyber Sunday. When Vicky and Chavo interrupt and Vicky tells Chris that he wasn't even that close to Eddie Guerrero anyway. Ugh. Uh, and then the boogeyman returns to SmackDown. Uh, Ted DiBiase and Tim Horner are let go after these tapings from their roles as agents. And it's in the observer where we see speculation that Horner wasn't good with finishes. And the times had passed old Ted by, and there was talk of having DiBiase be a part of the flair tag team gimmick and Ted just turned it down. Is that how you remember it happening with Ted and Tim no. Horner? No, Tim Horner wasn't any good. Tim Horner didn't fit in. Tim wasn't creative. Um, it just, you know, it, it was not something that Tim was made for. Uh, the go uh, home, go ahead. But, but on DiBiase, uh, you know, DiBiase had reached the point being on the creative team and trying to work backstage. Thing. Ted was really great at putting his matches together and being able to do what he did. I dare say Ted was one of the greatest of all time in that regard. However, unlike Pat Patterson, Ted wasn't really able to tell someone else how to do it. And Ted realized that. I don't think that Ted was fired at all. Uh, I think Ted, you know, and Stephanie had kind of come to an agreement that, you know what, this isn't, this isn't what I do well. I'm not doing a good job at it. Maybe it's best that I go home. But uh, Ted never wanted to be in a position of, of working in any way, shape, or form, or even possibly working. At the go home raw, the voting is pushed very heavily as it should be. And this is what the lineup looks like. You've got triple H and Shawn Michaels as DX and uh, they're going to be taking on edge and Randy Orton as rated RKO. And you have three different options for referees, Eric Bischoff, Jonathan coachman, or Vince McMahon. You would also see big show versus King Booker versus John Cena with the fans deciding which title would be on the line. Jeff Hardy's opponent for the intercontinental title to be chosen between Carlito, Shelton Benjamin, and Johnny Nitro. Umaga's opponent would be decided between the Sandman, Kane, and Chris Benoit. Ric Flair needs a tag team partner against the Spirit Squad, and we'll get to pick from Roddy Piper, Sergeant Slaughter, and Dusty Rhodes. And all three of the guys cut a promo as to why it should be them. Now, these guys are old school, and now they're trying to fit in in a more modern WWE program. How did the production and scripting of these promos go down with these quote unquote old timers? Just like everything else, gave them a script. They went out and did it. The main event of the go home raw is between Cena and coach. Shockingly enough. What do you know? Cena wins. And, um, I'm curious from your perspective, is that this polling thing, which is what makes the concept unique cyber Sunday. Is it also. What makes it a tough sell? Because you don't know exactly what you're going to get. You're asking people to pay for something that they may want to see, or they may not want to see. Absolutely. And the intrigue is in, is in what you could see. Yes. So you try to sell that up as, as much as possible. But to your point, I think there is that segment of the audience that is like, no, nah, I want to know what I'm paying for. Yeah. And do I have to do work to watch this show? I got to vote. Eh, I don't know. The only thing of note on the last ECW show before cyber Sunday is they announced an elimination chamber is going to be the main event of ECW's pay-per-view in December called December to dismember. It's one of the worst, uh, pay-per-views in history. Go check out our WWE ECW episode in the archives. It's one of our favorite shows. Uh, let's talk about the business end of things. The previous year's version of this cyber Sunday show. Uh, but back then, of course, it was called Taboo Tuesday. It was headlined by Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels versus John Cena for the title. It's on a Tuesday, 
and it got 174,000 buys. This Cyber Sunday, of course, is on a Sunday, uh, and the pay per view gets 228,000 buys. Is that just a function of the day of the week, do you think? Or do you think he really had that uh, much? Go ahead. It's a function of the day of the week. It's a function of the attraction. It's a function of the new gas station and open up down the street. It's just who's willing to, you know, it's all the above. It would be easy for us to, you know, rag on this concept because we, as we just said, you don't really know what you're getting when you buy it, but the show is up from no mercy the month before, uh, you have another 31,000 buys here than you did at no mercy. And overall, the wrestling observer readers thought the show was a thumbs down with 60% voting that way. Let's jump into the matches. First up, we've got Umaga and Kane. They go eight minutes and 39 seconds. Here's how we got there. 49% voted for Kane. 28% 28% voted for Sandman. Unbelievably, Chris Benoit came in last at 23%. Sandman, uh, this is uh, written up from the Observer. Sandman did a good promo on ECW TV asking for the votes, and uh, that explained him beating out Benoit. Meltzer would say, obviously, they're going with Cena versus Umaga and want to keep Umaga untouched until that point. Kane came off into a chop by Umaga, followed by Samoa and Spike clean in the middle. Kane didn't even do a big post-match sit up as they wanted Umaga over big as the story. So this is the very beginning of the big push of Umaga against Cena. And it's a big deal in this era to beat Kane in under nine minutes on pay-per-view. Pretty nice little showing for Mr. Umaga. Absolutely. And that was the whole idea, no matter who would have won. And I think that there was, you know, on a lot of this, uh, there was one definitely that was a shocker for us, but, um, I mean, yes and no in some, in some regards, but, um, on all these, you know, you kind of think, all right, I think that people internally thought, man, it it would probably be Benoit first, Kane second, and then Sandman in that regard, but it wasn't. Was it a surprise to you to see Sandman come in second on the votes ahead of Chris Benoit? It, It is to me. It was. Yes, it did. We, we definitely thought that Sandman would, would probably be last in the votes. Next up, we see crime time winning a tornado match over at Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch, the Highlanders, Charlie Haas and viscera. They go four minutes and 28 seconds. The, the fans picked a tornado match with 50% of the vote. 35% was tag team turmoil and 15% was fatal four way. Meltzer says this was the one where the election did nothing to influence since the match was never even announced on television to begin with the Highlanders did simultaneous dives out of the ring and the crowd died after it was crime time being the only of the four teams getting any kind of push. The finish saw Caden Murdoch, uh, do the, uh, high low on Rory, but JTG just threw him out of the ring and stole the pin. The post match saw them swerve Jerry Lawler and steal his computer. So it gets a star and a quarter, but it is kind of fun to see crime time getting a big push. And I guess Cade Murdoch are just in the background this early on. Uh, you watched it this week for the first time since it aired. what did you think? A cluster. <laughs> to say, to say at least I, I, I just have to laugh because it's like, okay, you got uh, a tornado match. Tag team turmoil match or a fatal four way. I mean, who gives a shit? You tell me the difference between those three matches. I was going to say, it's just words. Yeah. At that point it was, that was kind of, kind of funny, but it, it, it was what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, by any stretch of the imagination of like, holy shit. You got to see this one, folks. It was like, holy shit. Is it over? Thank you. So DX tells everyone to vote for Bischoff as referee. And they're explaining they'd already stuck Vince's head up big shows ass. So there's nothing left to do with him. And Jonathan coachman had been humiliated on raw. So triple H riles up Michaels about Bischoff saying Michaels isn't controversial. And he kept super kicking random non wrestlers in the hallway. This is one of the best skits at the time for DX. Is it better to uh, stick to this type of humor compared to the sophomoric humor they were really known for? Yeah, I liked it. And this, and this was one that, uh, actually triple H and and Sean came to us on and said, Hey, what if we did this? And a lot of that was their idea, especially the, the super kick hallway run. So Jeff Hardy is going to beat Carlito to retain the IT IC title in 1321. 
Carlito dominated the voting, getting 62% of the vote, only 25% for Benjamin, only 13% for Nitro. Meltzer would say there were some real communication problems early. The crowd popped big for the near falls in the final few minutes of the match. And the finish saw Carlito miss a hurricane runner off the top rope and Hardy pin him clean with a swanton. The crowd didn't appear to choose favorites. They did more flying than any other match, but a lot of it was off two stars. It seems like Carlito and Jeff and the other guys are doing a lot of, I don't know, mid card work. I mean, it feels like Carlito and Jeff should be higher on the card. Do you think the company had confidence in the ability to really push either one of these guys as the main attraction? I think that they were working to that. Would love to have had them both do that and looking for both of them to step up and do it. I thought the match was good. I thought that they went out and busted their ass and had a pretty damn good match, especially when not having all that time. You know, you have a general idea of, of what you want to do. If this guy's picked, if that guy's picked, if that guy's picked and you can tell early on, okay, where's the voting going? So you're going to lean that way. Uh, it seems like, uh, we should talk about Randy Orton next. He and edge are going to beat triple H and Shawn Michaels in 18 minutes and 11 seconds. The crowd votes 60% for Bischoff as referee and 20% for both McMahon and coachman Meltzer would say the match was a disappointment, not bad at all, but just it never got to the level you'd expect. Bischoff played a fair referee, actually counting slow and deliberate for both sides. Edge accidentally speared Bischoff edge speared triple H, but Michaels did a dive outside of the ring onto edge. Meanwhile, in the ring, Orton used the RKO on triple H with Bischoff down. Chad Patton ran in to be referee, but triple H kicked out. And after Orton blocked or was blocked for a second RKO, Michaels used a super kick on Orton and then triple H goes for the pin. Bischoff now pulls Patton out of the ring and decks him edge hits Michaels with a chair. And then Orton hits triple H with a chair right in front of Bischoff. Orton then used an RKO on the chair for the pin. Orton and edge after the match pushed that they had ended the DX winning streak and pushed their tag team name as the rated RKO tag team, two and three quarter stars. I guess we're trying to do a little bit of a passing of the guard, but it's the first time we've seen all these names together in a match, but even with all this talent, it just didn't exactly click. Maybe the way we had originally hoped, how big of a challenge is that? How frustrating is that when the guys, I mean, these are some of the best performers in the business and for whatever reason. Just wasn't meant to be that night. Well, I, I, I didn't think it was bad by any stretch of the imagination. I thought it was pretty damn good. And you have to add in, you've got a gimmick in the referee in the match. And first time, everybody had worked with everybody before in singles and in different incarnations and in every which way that you can possibly think of. And then putting in the tag and putting in the special guest referee, you're trying to serve a lot of masters. And... I think that as time went on, got a lot better, but I didn't think it was bad at all. I thought it was pretty good. Next up, uh, we've got, uh, Lita pinning Mickey James and, uh, eight minutes and seven seconds Ooh, buddy. to win the vacant women's title in a lumberjack match. And this was not great. Uh, lumberjack got 46% compared to 40% of the vote for an ODQ and only 14% for a submission match. Meltzer would write all the regular women from the three brands where they are dressed in various seductive outfits. Ross Buzz Lawler by saying these lumberjacks didn't look like Joe LaDuke, uh, with a flannel shirt and an ax. And the match was just brutal. It really put over just how good Trish Stratus is. All their traditional pro wrestling spots looked bad. Then they did submissions on the ground and the crowd didn't buy that. There were various spots where the lumberjacks attacked them. And right before the finish, they tried something that went awry and Ross said, what was that? Not only that, but whatever it was wound up being replayed. This is among the worst pay-per-view matches of the year. Lita one clean with a DDT negative one star. Boy, you want to talk about, you know, Fugly. Yeah. There's no way around it. This was bad. Yeah. The dream will say, sit back at, Ooh, Ooh, this is, this is just Fugly here, punk it head. Ain't none of ain't none of the little lumberjills out there around the ring. Ain't none of them know what to do. And then the two in the ring ain't got a clue what to do with the little lumberjills outside the ring. Do they understand what a lumberjack match is? We use each other him. Holy cow. 
Um, bad on all levels. Wasn't good. Wasn't good. It, it just shocks me sometimes that y- you, we assume a lot. And I guarantee you that none of them had ever been in a lumberjack match before and just didn't know how to work it. Let me ask this. Why would Lita be going over for the vacant title? If she's leaving in a month, just cause people wouldn't call it. I, who knew she was leaving in a month. One announced on TV. Why not? You, you have a happy baby face moment here. Okay. You got to get hot about it. Just seems I'm not like, half hot. Seems like in traditional wrestling sense, you'd, you know, Hey, they're leaving. So let's go with the other person. Try to give them the rub a little bit. Yeah. Next up. Let's talk about some history. Ric Flair, the nature boy and the hot Scott rowdy, Roddy Piper are going to become the oldest world tag team champions in history, beating Kenny and Mikey of the spirit squad. Fans voted 45% for Piper, 36% for dusty Rhodes, and only 19% for old Sergeant slaughter. Ross brought up Piper and flair as a tag team in the mid Atlantic area. Meltzer would say Piper physically looked horrible and he was the one doing the selling, which probably wasn't the best idea. Flair hot tagged in and got Mikey in the figure four, but Kenny broke it up the first time. The second time Mikey was stuck in the middle and Kenny couldn't save him. And he tapped really big pop. And it played out well as it was sold. Like it was a miracle that they were, uh, tag team champions. And, uh, Meltzer would say, imagine if the belts weren't so devalued, the post-match saw Rhodes and slaughter do a run in and clean house on the entire squad. And they danced in the ring together. And that was something for the ages watching Sarge get down three quarters of a star. It's a pretty cool moment here for Piper and flair. What do you remember of this? <laughs> well, I, I remember really not knowing what the hell uh, dusty, I think was in the lead for a little while in there. And we're like, oh, okay, well shit, man, it's going to be dusty. And, uh, that'll be fun. Dusty and Rick. And then Piper kind of, you know, took over on that. And my, now my pick was when we looked at these guys, Oh, Piper's going to landslide. They're going to vote Piper. Cause Roddy hadn't been around. Right. Um, but then as we got into it, it was like, Oh shit, they want to see dusty. And then Roddy took over there at the end, but it was, yeah, it was horrible. Uh, the match was terrible. It was, um, it was basically Kenny and Mikey, you know, kind of bumping all over for the legends and doing all the, you know, the thumb in the eye and the kick in the nether regions and things of that nature to just kind of get by with it. But it was, it was a good legend nostalgia match. Look, I don't care how bad someone may look physically sometimes, and sometimes it really is horrible, but it was fun to see the legends in there doing, doing that and getting another bow. Uh, it it was a really cool moment, uh, especially, you know, considering we're not going to see too much more of Roddy Piper here in WWE, um, Booker and Charmel are going to try to get Cena to make a pact to work together because show was so huge. Cena listened and said he'd do it, which shocked everyone. And then he said only under one condition, he gets a night with Charmel. Of course, she's furious and Booker tells her to leave. And then with her gone, Booker said, that's okay. And that's a deal. And then Cena says that's sick. That's his wife. And Cena said, it's only because he never thought he would agree to that and talked about how twisted he is. They left the room and in front of Charmel, Cena apologized, but then pretty much told her that Booker had agreed. She's pissed. And this leads to another Ron Simmons damn spot. This is some pretty funny shit here. And it feels like it's got Vince's fingerprints all over it. Yeah, it was funny shit. And it was, it was, again, you're building Cena's personality here and it was, it was good shit. And we look back and you look at King Booker. And to me, I think that, uh, King Booker was probably the most entertaining King that we had had up to that point. I I think that King Booker became King Booker and Charmel with him. She was the queen. It was an excellent package, man. And Booker was able to take that King gimmick over the top, but yet in the ring, he kicked ass. 
And that's what was so special about it. Now it's time for our main event. And really it's just a backdrop for John Cena, Kevin Federline. Uh, but here it is 12% of the fans voted for Cena's title to be at stake since he's the baby face. 67% of the fans voted for Booker's title to be on the line and 21% for big show's title. So King Booker ultimately retains and wins the mythical champion of champions title, I guess, uh, beating John Cena and big show. They go 21 minutes and five seconds long match for the big show here. Of course, shows taken out early. When Cena drop kicks his knee outside of the ring and show who was holding the steps falls headfirst into him. So he's out of the match for the next eight minutes. And of course he comes back and destroys everyone show got Cena on his shoulders in an electric chair spot. Booker came off the top rope with a missile drop kick, but to show's face instead of Cena show suplexed both men at the same time in the finish would see Cena kick a chair into big show's face as he took a bump on the floor. Charmel then runs in with the title belt. But Cena caught her and gives her an FU after teasing it. Booker grabs the belt and goes to use it, but Cena put him in the STFU. Kevin Federline then runs in and hits Cena with a belt shot. Cena no sells it and gets up, and then Federline runs off. But when Cena turns around, Booker hits him with a belt shot and gets the pin. And the closing shot of the show was Federline mocking Cena as opposed to Booker celebrating. So two and three quarter stars. It's a big moment. For, uh, for Booker T to get a win here, but it's really all about Federline and John Cena. What'd you think? I thought it was a fun match and, and, and it was all about Federline and getting to the whole Cena blow off and all that shit on television. And that was where we were going and Booker T man played his part to a T. Oh, listen to you. So lame. What? Um, What'd you think of this show, man? You watched it back. It got 60% thumbs down. Not a lot of great stuff on here. I mean, the, the one spot with, you know, Ric Flair and and Piper winning, and then the little post-match celebration, that's good stuff. But some of the, and it's promising to see you MAGA and, you know, you're making some progress and I know you look back fondly at the Kevin Federline stuff, but you can't give this a thumbs up, right? This is thumbs in the middle for you. Yeah. I think it was an average show. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it wasn't great. It was good, but it was, it was average because you didn't really have by virtue of the show, the, the, the show and the audience participation, that was the gimmick. Michael, so you Mc- didn't have the strong issues and angles. I think that we would have really needed. Michael McClanahan wants to know, was there ever any thought given to having Kevin Federline be the guest referee of the champion versus champion versus champion match? Instead of having it just be a run in at the end, it seems like advertising Federline may have been a way to increase some pay per views. With where we were going with Kevin, it wouldn't have fit at the time. I think you needed to get more heat on Kevin with John, and we would have had to rush it to get to that point. Let's do another one here. This comes to us from Adam. Does Bruce think there will ever be a time where nostalgia pops like Piper and Flair don't work? Well, I hope not. I, I think that. You know, sometimes it's funny. My kids are 22 and, and you go back and you look at who was the big star in, in 2000 or who was the big star in, in 1999 and the 20 year olds, they don't know, they don't know those guys for a lot. And I don't know that nostalgia is as important to people anymore. I, to put it this way, I sure hope that they will always get that pop because I think that without those that came before us, you won't have anything for the future. Lindsay wants to know, was anyone surprised by Piper's body here in this episode? <laughs> Roddy probably was. Oh, I've been, I've been working out. You want to see my ab? No, I, no, I feel great. Best shape I've been in in years. God, don't say that, Roddy. Yeah. Sterling wants to know, Roddy and Rick were both in their 50s on this show. What fellow 50-plus pal would Bruce pick to tag with in 2021? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, that pro- that's simple. Come on. The Undertaker. Oh, okay. Right. Who else? I mean, that's a good Kane. 
Kane. Kane's another good one. Yeah. Uh, triple H hope he's feeling better. Yeah. I hope he is too, but yeah, I, he is uh, feeling better. He's, 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 he's coming along and I want to say like, well, yeah, I hope he is too. No, he is. He's, he's moving along, man. That, that, you know, more power to him. Absolutely. Uh, Michael says, personally, I loved crime time and they seem to have a huge fan following. Why didn't they ever win the tag titles? And you can't say they didn't need them. I don't know that the time was ever right for them to win the tag team championships. I, their gimmick was so strong. And those two guys were so friggin' entertaining. There was just, I don't know what it was, but there was something amiss once the bell rang with them and connecting with the audience. If you could have done vignettes with them uh, all day, every day, I think they would have been one of the most over teams we ever had. They were fun. Let's, um, let's finish it up with Matt's question. He says, with a pay-per-view like this being so far ahead of its time, why hasn't it been revived? He liked the interactive angle. I think everybody did. Yeah. I like the interactive angle and it's, it's, it's a shame that it hasn't been brought back, but maybe the, the feeling of the audience not knowing what they're going to get is probably the biggest. I want you draw back to that type of a pay-per-view that type of promotion. Uh, next week, man, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite shows ever survivor series, 1996. It was 25 years ago in Madison square garden. Sid's going to take on Shawn Michaels for the world title. Bret Hart is going to make his in ring return against stone cold, Steve Austin. Rocky Maivia is going to make his in-ring debut for the WWF. Plus we'll talk about Brian Pillman's gun angle, Roddy Piper signing with WCW, Kurt Henning, no showing the WWF and a bunch of other stuff from the end of 1996. One of our favorite years to talk about. I'm pumped to be talking about 96 again next week, dude. It was an interesting time in the business and in a time that when you look back, when history looks back, probably one of the most pivotal years ever in the industry because so many things changed because of WCW's emergence and the uh, Monday night wars and what have you. Um, it was a, it was a crazy time to be in the business. And it's going to be a crazy time for us next week, right here on something to wrestle. Bruce, what's your schedule look like this week? When do you think we'll be able to sit down and knock out survivor series? You know, if I say it, I jinx it. Well, if I say, if I say Wednesday, um, I'll be having that four o'clock at 10 30 at night. And so I'm, I'm not going to say I, I refuse. I'm not going to jinx it. Right, I'm going to try. And I'm going to say, Kim, we're going to try Tuesday morning. I know it's not going to happen, but <laughs> I can, I know that one won't happen Tuesday afternoon. That's the day. That's that the one won't happen. either. Wednesday morning. First thing, not a chance. Wednesday, about six o'clock at night possible. Okay. So there you go, boys and girls. It might happen, but probably not. Uh, Bruce is busier than a one arm paper hanger, but we greatly appreciate you guys sticking with us. We hope you uh, agree with our adage here that, Hey, uh, better late than never, but we're looking forward to one of my favorite shows ever next week, right here. Don't miss it. Something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. It's survivor series, 1996. Bruce, thanks for making some time on your Sunday. I'm glad you're hey. Here and grinning like a possum. We had fun today. We did have fun today. See, it's always, and you know this, I actually dread when I'm sitting there sometimes and I'm going, no, man, I'm going to get out of here. I, I dread sending you the text or calling you because I miss, I miss our time. I miss our few minutes before we actually start recording. I miss our time afterwards. And I always hate to say, Hey man, sorry, I won't be getting home until two 30 tonight. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely swamped. And oh, by the way, I had a morning packed in for tomorrow morning now. So, um, whereas before I was trying to make my Tuesdays light. Now my Tuesdays are resembling Wednesdays and Thursdays and every other day of the fucking week. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're going to make it work. And, and, uh, cause I do, I look forward to it and I, Love the audience and thank you guys for sticking with it and waiting. I greatly appreciate that because I know you don't have to, but I do appreciate it and I appreciate you and I'm going to have fun next week because it is my favorite time of uh, the wrestling business when things are getting a little crazy. Well, they're going to be getting crazy and we appreciate you guys getting crazy with us every single week here. We'll be back next week. We are pumped about it too, man. Stay tuned. 
It's Survivor Series 1996 on something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Rock on. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.